On March 15, 2019, the sleepy streets of Christchurch echoed with the sound of fear. Fifty men, women and children were killed by one man just before Friday prayers. But this story isn't just about the Australian man charged with their murder. It's about surviving New Zealand's worst terror attack. A story of how communities came together when it mattered most to love and honour each other. Fessel Abbas was preparing for Friday prayers inside the men's washroom at Al Noor Mosque when he heard a loud noise outside. So first I thought maybe it's uh, just a short circuit or something and maybe I should go out and help and I opened the door and I, when I was going out I heard another two shots. Ayman Jabala was down the hallway waiting to pray in the main hall. When I heard the first shot, being the facility manager, I started to think it must be a neon light bulb that went off. But then I heard the second shot and I was still in denial and some people were running straight. I didn't look at, I don't even know who was running straight. I was, honestly, all I was caring for was myself at that point. And there was a right, the right hand side wall. I looked at it and I jumped right over it. The shooting was going on. People were yelling, uh, they were screaming, um, and he was just firing. And I started calling the emergency services triple one. I had no idea what to tell them. I was like, I was whispering, 101 Dean's F shooting. And it was really hard for me because I can't whisper. So it's, it was really difficult. You froze. Yeah, I was. I was not moving at that time. I was literally, the phone was in my hand and I was, my mouth was literally close to the, uh, to the mic. Leaving the dead and dying behind, the gunman would turn his attention to those innocently walking on the streets. Yasir Amin and his 67-year-old father, Muhammad, were making their way to Al Noor when they saw a silver hatchback approach. The killer, maybe he was just 20 meters away from us. We were running away and after three, four seconds, I just sat down on the ground and turned back. That's, I, I noticed when he drove away the car, I went back to my dad because by that time I wasn't sure if he got any bullet or not. But when I, I saw him lying on the ground and there was suddenly there was lots of blood, blood around his body. The attacker continued to his second target, Linwood Mosque, 10 minutes away. There, he would meet resistance that saved lives. Abdul Aziz Wahabzada, originally from Afghanistan, was inside the mosque when he heard gunshots. I just ran outside and there was a FPAS machine on the table. I just grabbed that one. I ran to a, a front of the mosque and I see one man is um, parking his car just at uh, the front of the driveway and he just starts swearing at me when I just throw that if was machine on him. The gunman started shooting at Aziz, who ran around the back of the mosque. There, he found a weapon next to a dead body. I just picked that shotgun up, pulled the trigger, there was no bullet in it. I didn't want him to go inside the mosque because we had a lot of uh, people, young, old. Aziz said there were up to 80 people inside Linwood Mosque when it was attacked. Then I heard some more shot coming from inside the mosque. I had the shotgun in my hands. I don't know if the guy see me or he didn't see me. He dropped his gun, he ran, and I ran behind him. I threw that shotgun like an arrow on his car and uh, smashed his window. And that time I could see he got frightened. The shooter would be arrested 10 minutes later. As police arrived at Al Noor Mosque, the scene of the first attack where they found Faisal Abbas hiding in the toilet. 
and I said, I'm the one who called. They were like, yes, come out, but um, slowly so that we can search you. And they searched me and they were like, no, clear. And then he said, just put down your head and exit. Don't see anything, don't stop, just run. When it really hit me was, when I really understood what really happened, is when he saw the people coming out from the mosque with wounds. But then I saw um, someone I know carrying his four-year-old uh, dead son in his hands. One of the first people to have been killed in the attack was Haji Daud Nabi, an immigrant from Afghanistan who had lived in Christchurch for decades Nabi is said to have welcomed the attacker at Al Noor, saying hello, brother. His son Yama and granddaughter arrived at the mosque as the police cordoned the area off. Next to the doorway of the mosque, there was body lying. Body was lying. My heart was saying, that's dead. Because I know that's head, you know, like I couldn't see his face, you know. My heart was saying, dead, dead, and I was telling the police officer, just let me in, please, it's all right. Just let me go see my dad, please, it's all right, you know. But the officers, they were doing their duty. News of the attack had circulated widely, with relatives desperately trying to reach loved ones at the targeted mosques. When I came out, I had 80 missed calls on my phone and everyone uh, on, my, on my WhatsApp, I had like over 300 messages. Um, I sent my wife um, a message at 1, 152, I think, when it was almost done, when the guy was leaving. And when I came out, she was the first one I texted. Yeah, last night we were discussing that you were the last one that I texted. And you were the first one when I came out. Excuse me. <coughs> so I explained it to her that uh, you were the last one because I wanted to make sure that I'm alive. <clears throat> and I wanted to not know till I tell you I'm alive. While Faisal was able to reach his wife, on the other side of Hagley Park, Khushbu Vora was anxiously trying to reach her husband, Ramiz, and his father, Asif Vora. I just continued the call my husband, but he's not responding my call that time. So I thought like maybe uh, his mobile was in the car or something like that. I'm trying to call my husband that like he just picked the phone or like he just messaged me that I'm all right. Like, but he's not responding that time. So I was a little angry as well. Why he's not responding me because it's not happened before as well, like they are not responding my call. Like if if they can't respond, at least they just message me that I, I was here. That's why I'm not responding your phone. But that, that day, it, he's not even responding my call and like my message as well. Maisha Bora was born a few days before the attack. But her father, Ramesh, couldn't hold her because she was kept in an incubator for six days due to complications. And they are not giving any news or anything to us. But, and I have to stay two nights with my baby because I have to like feed her. I feel somewhere like it's something happening. They are like hiding something for me. Next morning, I just came at home and I just told her that, like, now you told me what happening, and like, yeah, he just told me that like, he's no more, and like, and then I just break down. Khushbu Vora wasn't the only one left in the dark that day. 
Amber Rashid was preparing an evening meal when her sister called, asking where her husband Naim and son Talha were. I thought in my heart, like, why is she asking me? Because it's Friday and it's uh, obvious that she, they would be at the masjid. So, yeah, they're masjid. So she said, uh, actually, like, there's, uh, I have heard that there's some shooting at the masjid and many people have died. But then I, when I saw my mobile phone, there was no message. So I had a feeling that something's wrong. Hours passed. Umber then decided to watch the video the attacker had live streamed and was still circulating on social media. Soon as I saw it, I could see Naim there. And nobody has said it till then that like it was Naim. I don't want to say it, but I have seen it, seen him in the video. Umber is left with taking care of five-year-old Ayan and 19-year-old Abdullah. We'll get back on our feet and you know, this life is going it's, it's temporary, you know, all you, it's a constant struggle. That's what my dad told us, you know, it's just, this life is a constant struggle. And, sh and my brother said, it's just a way to get to the hereafter, to get to a better place in the hereafter. Nine, he was alive. <laughs> A very brave person. Yeah, I'm so proud of him. Talha too. I've heard that like he died as a shield. He he was a martyr, like a shield for his friend. Amber Rashid received Talha and Naim's remains five days after they had been killed. Some families were angry at the delay in releasing bodies, calling it a violation of the 24-hour. Islamic burial rule. The government said it was following procedure. This process is frustrating uh, and it is starting to frustrate the community and, and from the city's point of view we're trying to support the families but we can't interfere with the coronial process, it's a legal process. It looks really beautiful, hopefully it will be yummy. Tuba Marwak prepared a pot of fresh biryani. As a husband, Habib Marwak a community leader explained the difficulties of comforting grieving families desperate for closure. The one big and horrifying thing was that most of our community members didn't knew the processes, that there is a lot of process involved. And it was not one or two, it was 80 people they were dealing with. 80, that's 50 was already 40 or 50 was dead at that time, but there was injured that was in hospital. The attack audacious in its simplicity, was an attempt to divide communities along racial lines. But the grieving process had the opposite effect. Communities came together where lifelong childhood friendships are made, in the garages across the city. There we met Taila Talib Hunt, married to one of the victims, Naim Rashid's niece. So that's, this here is um, our family, it honors our father. Originally a Maori, Tyler converted to Islam five years ago. It's very hard to comprehend the things that, that we see and that we hear. As Muslims, we selfishly weep, we selfishly cry because we will not get to see these people ever, you know, until we get to Jannah, inshallah. But we are actually smiling. We are happy knowing that these people are lucky enough to be able to have the opportunity to go to Jannah, inshallah. On the day of the burials, brothers Harrison, Tia and Tyler organized a hakka for Naim and Talha Rashid. Standing in front of their caskets, the Maoris pay tribute as they have done for centuries. The haka is a traditional art form for us. It is used to portray and evoke emotion. And that emotion can be anger, uh, frustration, challenge. Um, but it also is used to portray and evoke love, sympathy, to build empathy with others. And so what you will have seen is in some forms the haka used in anger, in anger at these atrocious acts by one person on March 15th. Frustration that this has occurred within our 
city within our country? And how could this have been allowed to have happened? But also love, love and support for the Muslim community. The grieving took many forms. Thousands paid their respects with flowers and handwritten notes. The message was clear. New Zealand rejected the violence perpetrated on March 15th. It was a sentiment articulated by New Zealand's Prime Minister. Wearing a Muslim headscarf, Jacinda Ardern became a symbol of resilience and comfort in the face of despair. What words adequately express the pain and suffering of 50 men, women and children lost and so many injured? What words capture the anguish of our Muslim community being the target of hatred and violence? What words express the grief of a city that has already known so much pain? I thought there were none. And then I came here and was met with this simple greeting. Assalamu alaikum. Through pain and suffering, New Zealand has come together and dealt a blow to hate ideology. We are grateful that people have rallied around us and uh, lifted us up. It's important for us to come here to give them some closure um, and just to respect them. We are a loving country who accept everyone and that doesn't define who we are. It is this response that families of the murdered hope will encourage others to stand up for peace. What the killer doesn't know is he's gravely, gravely, gravely mistaken if he thinks that we will retaliate with violence. We will come back with love, we will come back with peace, and we will come back with solidarity. We cannot allow that kind of violence, that kind of racism, that kind of Islamophobia to exist. We will not allow it. And everyone in New Zealand has tried to show that and make that clear to the world, and I hope I hope that the world has seen that. I hope the world respects that. And I hope the world changes simply because of what we have shown over the last week and two days. When the cameras are gone, when the people are gone, when we are back to our routines, when people start back their work, that will be the time that, that it will hit us again. And I think so, for that we will be ready. I feel sorry for the attacker, yeah, because he had hate in his heart. He can't feel the happiness, the satisfaction, the contentment that we do, because he has a heart full of hate, and we have a heart full of love. Allah, 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 Allah,